build your own house well, you are not qualified. And if you do it anyway, you are wicked in the sight of God. It's just that simple. He said, well, no, I'm doing something good for the Lord. He told you not to. So you must be doing it for someone else yourself at that point. Okay. So hi and welcome to Reconstructing Podcast. My name is Monica Henderson and I'm joined by Laura Arthur. And together we provide a platform for restorative chats and stories of healing and rebuilding after religion-based spiritual abuse. Today's episode is going to be awesome. It's um, just coming full circle for us, and you'll find out why. Uh, but I do want to stress a uh, content warning for today's episode. We're going to discuss um, intense emotional and physical abuse of children and women. And um, if those are possible triggers for you, we um, just ask that you possibly you know, consider not watching. Uh, or watching, just being ready to pause, pause the button. We don't want to trigger anybody. Um, our episode calls attention to abuse suffered at the hands of Pastor Stephen Anderson and his wife, Jujana Anderson, both of Faith for Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. Now, open disclosure, both Laura and I were members of Faith for Word Baptist Church until July of 2020. We left willingly uh, during a major scandal that exposed Pastor Anderson's lack of pastoral qualifications. And we are set to discuss these issues uh, during the latter end of this interview, so make sure to watch until the end. Um, several days ago, a YouTube video was released by a channel called Dead Domain, and it featured John Anderson, the 19-year-old son of Tempe, Arizona's notorious NIFB pastor, Stephen Anderson. In the video, Stephen Anderson's adult son details for the first time the cruel treatment, cruel treatment and physical abuse he and his siblings have suffered since childhood at the hands of his parents. As of last night, that interview has garnered 40,000 views. A uh, couple days after that, he released another video uh, on the Preacher Boys podcast, also on YouTube. As of last night, that video has 5.3 thousand views, and it discussed um, just in depth more of his testimony and his story of survival. Now, if you've never heard of the New Independent Fundamental Baptist Movement, the NIFB, as we're going to call it, here's a flash primer. Per Wikipedia, the NIFB is an association of right-wing King James-only independent Baptist churches that began with Stephen Anderson of Faithful Word Baptist Church out of Tempe, Arizona. Faith Word Baptist Church, with Anderson at the helm, as well as some of its affiliated congregations, have been embroiled in controversy over the recent years. Four years ago, a scandal rocked Faith Word Baptist Church and its congregants, and this scandal openly questioned Stephen Anderson's pastoral authority. Today, we have the awesome privilege to speak with John Anderson. Uh, and this is his 19-year-old son, third in line out of 12 si siblings. And we are so privileged and so happy you can be here with us today, John. Thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. So I just wanted to um, just put a couple facts about the National Children's Alliance that reports that an estimated one in four girls and one in 13 boys in the U.S. are estimated to experience child abuse. Child abuse can be emotional, physical, and psychological. Laura, did you want to ask any questions before we start? Oh, yes. So I wanted to, right off the bat, we wanted to just ask you a couple questions. Are you a Christian? Are you yeah, a Christian? Yeah. Okay. I 100% right. believe the Bible and profess Christ. And I believe the same gospel that my dad taught for years. And I'm sure many of the people in that church believe. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So um, this one's. I'm just asking some hard questions for you to get it out of the way. Are you on drugs or have you been no. on drugs? No, okay. I'm not. Yes. Um, I kept seeing that in comments and I think that, and then I heard from some extended family members that cut contact with me that my dad called them and told them I was on drugs. And my brother told me that my dad asked him if I was on drugs and my brother, my friends, everyone, my dad was asking was like, no, he's not on drugs. He doesn't have drugs. I do not use drugs. I am not a drug user. Yeah, and we absolutely I, believe that. We just want the world to understand job, this as well. My job drug and tests. I couldn't. I was even gonna do that. say you have like, a job yeah. that is, is right. If people are questioning, 
they can know that he is currently employed right. with a job that drug tests him on a regular basis. There is no yes. question <laughs> about his sobriety. We got that. Not sure Good where job. that got started. That is just my dad well, it's, railing it's a in an way effort to... to discredit me. Exactly. So, and the third thing that we really want to get out there is, did you, did you attempt to contact other pastors or other people within the NIB movement leaders before you went to, I believe his name is Jordan mm -hmm. and preacher. Yeah. Boys, I, don't, I don't know. Eric. So, so what happened with that was when this all happened, it was obviously very conflicting and it was something I prayed about. And eventually the decision I made was that it wasn't out of spite for my dad or wanting to get revenge for my dad. It was out of understanding that he is not somebody that belongs behind the pulpit. He is not somebody that belongs having an audience because he has so blatantly disqualified himself for multiple different reasons, which we'll get into later. But he is somebody that has always professed and always taught that public figures should be publicly held accountable. And people were saying, oh, well, you shouldn't have aired out family dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. Well, there's family dirty laundry. And then there is him doing things that are illegal and violent and go blatantly against the standards set forth in the Bible, because people should know the kind of church that they are taking their family to. People should know the kind of pastor that they're getting marriage and parenting advice from. So I did approach four Baptist pastors, three of which identify as new IFB, and none of them would speak about this. Um, one of them, two of them I contacted before going to Jordan, two of them I contacted after. Uh, one of them said... I said, hey, could you give me a call? I'm interested in talking to you about a situation. And I didn't give anything else. Like, I didn't say anything else, right? I said, hey, can I give you a call? I want to talk to you about something. And this is somebody that, like I personally knew. And he straight up was like, I'm not interested in talking about this situation. So he clearly knew what I was going to bring up. Right. So I texted him back and I said, so do you, be I said, do you believe that somebody who has a long history of spousal and child abuse is qualified to be a pastor? He never responded to that message. Um, another pastor didn't respond to my message whatsoever. And then two of them just kind of like asked a couple questions. But when I was like, so is this something you're interested in talking about? Is something they never, they kind of just like, they were not interested whatsoever. Right. They don't in want to it. touch that. And, and I, I experienced a similar thing when we, we had problems and we, we had problems with harassment after we left from members and, you know, from some, well, actually from your, your dad saying some pretty, and your mother also. Um, so we reached out to pastors just by right. email, you know, just to have a conversation because we thought we could deal with it as adults and as Christians, right? And amongst ourselves, and we were looking for some kind of guidance and they told us similar, if they responded, it was, we don't want to touch it. We're and not involved, with... not our church, not our problem. Uh, even though these were people that we knew personally and had, had gone to their church at time at one time too so yeah and with that was Jordan, disappointing so yeah whatever opinion you have about Jordan as a person or morally whatever the that interview is not him giving his opinion or anything right. like that it is just him providing a platform and there's somebody with over a hundred thousand YouTube subscribers that provided mm -hmm. that platform. They're just mm -hmm. asking questions. All they were were a catalyst for me to tell my story. So it was good. It, yeah. Hey, maybe you, you should it. ask yourself the question of why no Baptist pastors were willing to mm -hmm. talk about him. Right. Bingo. Right. Yeah. Bingo. What was your intent in contacting them? Did you just want to talk to them one on one, or did you want them to feature you on their channels, or? So, so the first pastor that I contacted, it was with the intent of wanting to, of asking for guidance on it because it was a pastor that I very much looked up to and I consider, and I have gone to his church a lot and I considered him to be like my second pastor, you know, obviously my church that I was going to for my childhood was my dad's church, but I considered to be like a second pastor. So I wanted to talk to him. Um, and he had no interest in talking about it or providing any guidance or providing any advice. The other three I went to, it was with a thing of like, Hey, is this something, this is something that should be talked about. Is this mm -hmm. something that you are willing to talk about since this is somebody you have publicly affiliated with and publicly promoted? Mm -hmm. 
Was this, were you already estranged from your parents at this time or was it before that? No, this was, this was a few days after I after. transferred. Okay. This is another thing, by the way, um, that my parents, are, my dad is saying that he cut me off and then I did all this as revenge. No, I cut my parents off mm -hmm. because of what they were doing. The last time I saw my dad, a couple hours before I filed the CPS report, I saw my dad that morning. That was like what I witnessed in the home that morning. That was the final straw. I was getting off work and it was like, I don't know. 8 a.m. or something. I'm just getting off work on my way home, stopping by. And my dad sees me and he's like, hey, son, how are you? You getting off work? And it wasn't uncommon for me to stop by on my way home from work. And everything was cool. Then a couple hours later, he found out I was going to CPS and I had had a conversation with my mom, basically explaining, standing up to her and standing up for my younger siblings. And then he cut me off. And then he was like, well, I don't want anything to do with you. But no, he did not cut me off and it is as revenge. Okay. okay. We and were was, on perfectly good terms prior to this. You said something there that um, you witnessed something that was the final straw for you before you went to CPS. Was there an incident of abuse that happened that you witnessed? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, so that was, growing, that was recent for people who are, yeah, growing, are wondering if this is still ongoing because I think the other... Um, criticism is a lot of people are like, oh, well, that was then and now they're better and what, you know, but this is an ongoing thing. This is not something that just happened and it has rectified some magical way. Um, so you the recently abuse, saw an It's incident. not as bad as it was. Sorry, it's, not, it's yeah. not as bad as it was, it has slowed down a lot, but it is still far beyond what is outlined in the Bible, what is outlined mm -hmm. by the law, and what any child should have to go through. And all eight kids in that home are not safe. And I have witnessed abuse virtually every time I have come over as an adult after moving out, as well as it was an ongoing daily thing while I lived there. Okay. Can you kind of retell what that instance of abuse was <clears throat> that you saw that, that day? Just a... um, just just to get into it, basically, my mom was upset because she felt that my sister was like took too long to get ready in the morning, and she started screaming at my sister, insulting her, attacking her, calling her names. Right, typical of most of us. Then she didn't like this attitude, my sister, and she started hitting my sister, um, hitting her in the face mm -hmm. and hitting her all over the body with a piece of wood, and like. Yeah, wow. uh, not at all uncommon from her. And she and the reason she said and she kept giving she gave the illustration of like. um, Oh, man, well, if your job tells you you have to clock in at a specific time, you can't clock in and then start getting dressed, blah, blah, blah. Oh, my. And and I and it's like, well, your your kids aren't at work. They're at home. And if you make somebody feel like they're always at work, that is going to drive them nuts. Nobody oh, yeah. lives at work. That is that is a horrible way to look at things. That is so oh. like what like like that doesn't even make it's sense. Warped, yeah. Right. But that is something warped. she's always had. And that abuse that I witnessed that day was far from the worst I saw. And it was something I just slowly, slowly came to terms with over the years, noticing more and more that what my parents were doing was not biblical, was not legal, and was evil yeah. and sadistic in a lot of ways. And then I don't know what I don't know what it was that morning, but I got home and I I called my mom out on it that time. I was like, hey, what are you doing? And like we got in a bit of a fight and I got home and I I sat down and I spent hours trying to rectify in my mind, trying to make sense of any possible way, because you want to believe your parents are good people of how a good person and how somebody that was not completely deranged and twisted and evil could have done the things that I witnessed both of them do my whole childhood. And finally I came to the conclusion that it worked. So I called my mom and I said, Hey, we need to talk like this is serious. Like, and I basically wanted her, I wanted to give her one last chance to give me any indication that she had any remorse that she was willing to change, that she could change that she was capable of being a better parent, being a better person. And she told me to go F myself. And I said, I will call CPS then. And she said, she didn't believe me. Uh, my dad called me and then I was kind of hoping that maybe, maybe he'll talk to me. And like, obviously somebody at that age, after doing this for over 20 years, they're not going to change. But I was just holding on to that last little bit of hope. And then my dad called me and I said, dad, like, can we have a conversation about this? You know, like two adults be respectful to each other within 30 seconds of me talking. He was screaming at me, telling me to go F myself. And 
I got off the phone and that was the closure I needed. And it was the hardest thing I have ever had to do. But I went and I called CPS because they had had warning after warning. And both me and my older brothers as adults would bring stuff up to my parents like, hey, why did you do this growing up? That wasn't right. That was abusive. That was wrong. And my dad would always his approach was always like, yeah, like, cool, whatever. My mom very much wanted to have a relationship with her adult kids. So she would be like, oh, I'm sorry. But she never took responsibility. She always blamed us, blamed my dad, blamed others and never changed. And I and it was like kind of reached a point where it's like, you're not really sorry, because if you were sorry for abusing me when I was six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, then you wouldn't still be abusing your six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds. So that shows to me that there was no remorse. She was not sorry. She had had enough chances. Both of them had had enough chances. And now it is time for them to face the consequences of their actions. Yeah, I, I have a question. And I was wondering this pretty much the whole time after you came out with your story. Do you know if your parents were abused or neglected as children? Do you know any of their history? Um, my mom, yes. Um, that's something pretty personal to her. So I yeah. don't, I don't necessarily, oh, I'm not necessarily going to yeah. blast yeah. all of the internet, but I know my mom was heavily abused in a lot of ways growing up. Um, my dad, on the other hand, I think he had a loving, good childhood as far as I know. And like, I've spent a lot of time, I've lived with his dad mm -hmm. and I've spent a lot of time around both of them. And for as much, I, I think, I think, right to the best of my knowledge and from talking to my dad's siblings that they were loving good parents who provided a good Christian upbringing towards him. Yeah. Great. Thank you for answering that. Did it, I, I know you folks, you, your family lived in a pretty small house close to the church for many years. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered because I always complain my house is too small. There's seven of us and it's about almost 2000 square feet and I'm complaining all day how small it is. But I would always think, well, if they can live in that small house with 10 people, we can do this, right? So I would always go back to that. Um, did that Was that torture for you, living in a small space with all those people and all that anger? When I was 15 years old, I so as my parents kept having more kids, I kept sharing a room with more and more kids. And it kind of peaked at 15, because at 15, they moved into a new house. But when I was 15 years old, I shared a room with five siblings. There were five of us in one room. And I had absolutely zero privacy, zero personal space. It was just bunk beds stacked on top of each other, right? Like my bed's here, bed here, bed under me, bed under there. It's just like these like blocks of beds. And it was a very small house. It was a three bedroom home with all those people living in it. And there was no sense of privacy. There was no sense of ever being able to get away from what was going on. So right. there was all this intense anger and abuse happening. And then even when it wasn't directed towards you, there was no way to get away from it. There was no way to clear your head. We had a shed in the backyard. Um, it was an unair conditioned shed and it gets very, very hot in the summer. And I spent hours and hours of my childhood sitting in that shed in the extreme heat. And I like set up like a couple of camping chairs and I had, and that was like, my place to hang out and it was very very uncomfortable <laughs> like i'd have to like take my shirt off like double like a water because of just how hot it was being in a black unair conditioned shed out in the heat in the summer but it was better it was just anything to get out of that house i i figured she'd live there until i think she said in one of her videos one of her vlogs she would live there until all her kids moved out what prompted a, the move out um I don't, I don't fully know that. Honestly, I know that it was, I know that it had to do with some disagreement between my parents. Um, and it was kind of like, I think my dad wanted to stay and my mom kind of was like, just done living there. I, I, yeah. I, again, I don't really know fully. So I don't want to just get on here and speculate sure, sure. about that. Cause I just know that my parents, when they were like, Hey, we're moving, we're going to be looking for a new house. <laughs> yeah. So. John, as you were um, growing up, were all your basic needs met? Food, shelter, clothing, that type of thing? Um, somewhat. So as far as shelter, her kids, we were locked outside a lot. 
And in Arizona, if you live here, it's obviously a very hostile environment. It is a very unsafe environment. And we would be locked outside in the yard, all of our kids, right? Even down to the little toddlers, they would be locked outside for hours on end. And that was that wasn't uncommon because yeah, it was a small house. She didn't like being around her kids. So she would go lock us out there. Not really provided with water while we were out there. Like if we came knocking on the door for water, you'd probably get beaten or screamed at because she did it to get us away from there. As far as clothing, yeah, I think all my clothing needs were met. Um What about as far food? as Because food, we we heard a lot yeah, about food. withholding food. And I remember I, I used to follow your mom, obviously, and the Are You All Your or the All They Are All Yours blog, you know. And I remember there were several things that I was just like, wow, hmm, that's kind of like red flag here, red flag there, but we always explain it away. One of the things that I thought was a red flag at that time was that she had mentioned having a lock on the refrigerator was that a thing Um, yeah, uh, so she, she, like, had locks on her fridge because she was, like, really, like, paranoid about the kids taking food and, like, she, like, never wanted us to, like, snack between meals, um, and she, and food was always going missing, which is normal in a home with that many people living there, like, you lose stuff out of the fridge, and so she started, like, locking up the fridges, and that's kind of weird and controlling, it's not necessarily... abusive So, but to put you a lock were on the fridge you were allowed to have food and access but to food. well yes except food was withheld as a punishment Okay. and that is something that to my knowledge is illegal and from a moral standpoint withholding food from a kid for a day you know a small child needs to eat and it would be like oh you're having a bad attitude you talk back well you're not eating all day today It would be a full and day. that Yeah, Full up day to a full and day. I what age I would can't that be? And how often man, would like that like be? it was it was it's one of her more go to punishments. Usually it would be making them miss a meal. Um, but I I'd say there were definitely times it was up to a day, maybe even longer that I'm not thinking of. But yeah, little kids, like this was going all the way down to her four or five year old crying, going to bed, Mom, I'm hungry, and like And she's just 100% like, no, like you shouldn't have talked back then. You shouldn't have had a bad attitude. Go to bed. You're not getting dinner. That's heartbreaking, John. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I want to just ask for like a regular day in the life, if you could paint a picture of uh, while you were growing up, I'm not sure what age you'd want to do that. Maybe when things were really bad, um, how would a regular day in your life play out in your in your home with your mom? Yeah, I'd say the peak of the abuse was probably around like age seven to 11 for me. Um, and it was, you'd wake up and immediately have like, like a very, very long list of chores to do. And, and again, like, like, I'm not saying all of these things are abusive and maybe some people will agree with some of the stuff. I'm, this is, this is just, yeah, day in life. Uh, we had a chore list. You'd wake up, um, do your chores. There wasn't really a typical daily routine, but it was, we had a lot of chores to do in the morning. And then we would like do schoolwork or watch our younger siblings in the morning until lunch. Then after lunch, or no, it was more like, we were typically more like watching our siblings during the morning and then doing schoolwork in the afternoon. After lunch, after like the little kids went to nap, but if we did our schoolwork in the morning, then we could have free time in the afternoon, but it never really was free time because of how small the house was and how many little kids were napping. Like we couldn't, we weren't allowed to talk. We weren't allowed to walk around. We weren't allowed to really do anything. So it was pretty much like, it was just like all you were allowed to do in your free time was like read books because whenever the kids were up, we were just kind of made to work and take care of the kids and watch the kids. And then when the kids were asleep, we were so, my mom was so concerned with keeping them asleep mm -hmm. that we couldn't really do anything like fun. So maybe there was like a window of like an hour a day where we could kind of do whatever towards the evening and then dinner time. 
and then we get all the kids ready for bed do all that there's this myth that my mom is like this parenting expert good take care of kids she she doesn't she doesn't take care of her kids like that is most of that workload the vast majority of that workload is put on to her other kids and typically throughout the day you will find her either working on one of her businesses or side hustles or whatever or her content creating or just sitting on her phone scrolling or doing whatever she there's this thing of she's like this like great mom that takes care of her. She's, no, she's an extremely extremely lazy person as somebody that knows her she delegated pretty much every aspect of her life the one like I guess job that you would see her do was cook But then once my sisters reached an age where they once they got good at cooking, then she quit doing that most of the time as well. Um, the only reason she cooked is because my dad just had very high standards for food. So he wanted three made from scratch meals a day. So she was the only one who could do that. But everything else was put up to kids, you know, the chores, the cleaning, babysitting the other kids while she kind of just did whatever all day. And even, even her own stuff, right? It was, she did not do her own laundry. She did not put away her own laundry. She did not make her own bed. Nothing. She did not do anything for herself. She made all of us do everything for her and for the other kids. And the only time she would do something was when one of the kids like couldn't or nobody else could. And then she would usually scream at us and be irate. Like if she had to do something for herself, she would punish all of us for it, attack all of us for it, be very mad at all of us for her having to be a parent, which is something she decided to do. Right. And you, you mentioned that, that the screaming is the screaming a constant in your house. Cause mm -hmm. we all, you know, have our moments. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not perfect Yeah. and I've screamed in my life, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, everybody, but everybody gets my, mad. Yeah, the YouTube voice. Let's uh, discuss her YouTube voice, the persona that she puts forth. And one thing I really liked about her online was she had this soft, like very meek demeanor about her. And I could just listen to her talk. It was very comforting. And I was like, this lady's got it all together. Look at her, you know. And that was before I came and met her in person because I did. there is a crack in the facade when you meet her in person and you're around her in person. Um, but not probably showing the whole thing. We didn't get to witness that. Um, right. But there is a difference. Uh, let me just tell you to the people who are only aware of her online presence, mm -hmm. but um, was screaming, yelling, you said degrading. Those were daily. Mm -hmm. They were all day, Austin. every day. Okay. And abuse, physical, Because, I mean, you described a day that sounded somewhat okay, you know, and yeah, so ordered. That was, that and, was like... um, but in between all of the getting chores done, doing your school, this is constant yelling, constant abuse. Can you describe that? Can you describe what kind of abuse is it on the, you know, not that it matters, but to some people it might, um, the degree, um, It's in the face. It's using instruments. It's not done out of punishment. It's done out of anger. It's those kind of things. Could you elaborate yeah. on that? During a typical day, how many children were being abused? What were the age ranges? How often? And what triggered it? You know, that's a lot. There, there was no age range. I have seen my mom hit an infant more times than I could count, you know, and it wasn't even like, Obviously, a baby can't do anything wrong or break rules. No. So it'd be like, she's holding the baby, That's the baby's shocking. crying, and she'd hit the baby. She would do it with her hand, and she would do it like with a wooden spoon. And then obviously going all the way up to um, my dad beating 17-year-olds. And my mom wouldn't really do that much physically to her 16, 17-year-old, because it's like her son's at that age, like – are not are it's not she's not going to be able to have a formidable effect of that because it's like we're all much much bigger than her so but up to my 17 year old sister she was extremely physically abusive to my sisters all the way up to 17 and all the way down to them being an infant that cannot speak cannot crawl and she would probably beat kids between her and my dad i would say probably close to 20 beatings a day um of Of those, I would say probably about half would meet 
mm, a third, I'd say about a quarter to a third of those would meet the legal definition for abuse because obviously spanking is legal. Yeah. And it was about, I don't know, like, like as a kid, dude, I remember thinking it was a good day if I got three beatings in a day or something. And like, wow. I, my mom, I, that's like constant was, with that amount of constant, kids. That's constant, just a constant. Absolutely constant. She's, she was constantly screaming, constantly yelling. It was very uncommon for her to be happy. It was very uncommon for her to not be in an angry, pissed off mood. She was always mad at us. She was always fighting with her kids. And the beatings, it was not just – that's another thing I want to stress. It was not just where you broke the rules, you're going to get a punishment. It would be – she would be angry about something. Nearest kid to her would get their ass beat. The beatings were also used very often – um, for interrogations, she would be confessions, both her and my dad deny this. Now, again, um, if you are somebody that personally knows my family and has a way to contact my two older brothers that do not live at home, they may hold different opinions on my parents as people, but the actual facts of the matter of the abuse that they did and how they carried it out, they can back that up. And one of the tools that was used frequently was a folded up electrical power extension cable. Another one was a belt and it was not just on the buttocks. Like my dad teaches, it would be on the back. Um, getting hit in the face as a kid was extremely common. And with the electrical power cord that would leave bloody marks, you would bleed from that. Um, several times kid, kids would black out from it just because of the extreme pain like it wasn't it wasn't like they were knocked unconscious. It was like the pain would be so bad that you would faint. That happened to me. Um, and you'd be bleeding. You'd be sore. You'd go to bed that night and you'd be like laying in bed trying to get comfortable on those marks. And the that electrical power cord was used for about, I don't know, three, four year period when I was probably like seven to 11, 12 years old. And that was definitely like the worst of it. And yeah, I was getting beat with that thing multiple times a day. And I remember that is like the most fear I ever experienced is when you would, it would, it would be a minor infraction or no infraction at all. And my mom or my dad would start going for that cord and you would, and many, and it was immediately, you know, I'm a little kid and I'm nine, eight, nine years old. And I'm breaking down, crying, like begging her not to, um, and then one, two hits from that thing. So they would use that on your back or your buttocks, more commonly the back and one or two hits from that thing. And you drop, you're on the ground. It hurts so bad. And then I would be writhing on the ground and, you know, shielding your face, whatever, screaming, begging for her to stop. And it seemed that the more reaction you had, the more it would anger her, the more it would rile her up. And she is a psycho and she would get mad and she starts screaming, raving and just beating the absolute, just beat, yeah. beating these kids. My dad and my mom both more times I could count would say, I will beat you, would threaten to beat us within an inch of their life. And it very much felt like it. And as a little kid, I very much was constantly afraid for my safety, constantly afraid for, I remember laying in bed at night, paranoid that, you know, they were going to come in there and because we were pulled, I was pulled out of bed multiple times or was like pulled out of bed, start getting beaten just to get you to admit to something. And these beatings were very long. They were, it was not at all the punishment matching the wrongdoing. And in many cases, it was no wrongdoing at all. It was just my mom getting triggered and freaking out on the subject of child abuse. That was something my dad rarely would partake in. That was something that was the majority of the time done by my mom. That is not me saying that to defend my dad. I'm just being objective on this whole issue. A lot of people said after my first interview, I was defending my dad. No, my dad is equally a bad person who is not fit to be a pastor, not fit to be a parent. Number one, because he ever abused his kids, even if it was only every couple months instead of every couple hours, he still should not have children or have an audience. And he also was very abusive towards my mother, which I will get into later. And he should have stopped that abuse because he well, was, was aware say, of it happening all along. He should have stopped the, it. Right. The ruling your house well for a man to witness his wife abusing their, his own children. 
that should right. have been stopped at, at the beginning and he mm-hmm. could direct her and help her and get her the help that she needs or whatever the cause, but he is in charge of that house. So he is, yeah. he is liable if he is aware of the way that she's treating the kids and either giving the okay or turning a blind eye or participating in all of those. I mean, and you, those you are take, criminal you actions. kids into this world. You have to take care of them. You have to protect he them. He also their is a mandated reporter by his position mm-hmm. as pastor and also just the position of a parent. If you are in the care, if you are a caretaker to a child, you're a mandated reporter that automatically makes you one as a parent to a child. And if you are a pastor, you are a mandated reporter by him knowing of child abuse of course, participating in it. All of these are criminal things that he openly and proudly is doing and stubbornly is not repentant of. And it's, you know, for church Mm -hmm. members and followers, that's very important because we have qualifications of a pastor and it's important. And there are people who look up to these people for guidance. And when they use, you know, as he did kind of use the pulpit for his last few sermons clearly to people who are no, who know what is going on it's obvious but to others it might not be so much because he preached a sermon about um what he would say was spanking he preached a sermon about judging people by their appearances i believe that was to discredit you when people saw you no, he said you English. should judge people by their credit, by their appearances. By their appearances, yes. That when the Bible the... specifically says not to. Right. So he was priming. <laughs> he's he's planting. <laughs> he is a master at this of of making a sermon about something without making it about that. He just makes this sermon. It sprinkles a little bit of oh, okay, this is how I'm going to um, get ahead of this latest controversy against me. It's it's a very he's very skilled. I will give him that. And um, that's one thing that both your mom and him are very arrogant and boastful about is, you know, their ability to read people, tell when people are lying, analyze handwriting. And I know that your dad is a very skilled speaker and, and that's what he's doing in all of these things. But yes, he did preach. A, I didn't listen to all of them, but I got enough to go, okay, he's prime and but if they see you in a piercing and a, you know, a rock t-shirt and whatever, yes, they're going funny. to automatically um, have this seed planted in their head to discredit what you say. The next one is about how you spank your kids and I'm going to spank my kids. Well, this isn't spanking. This is not even discipline. This is rage. This is torment and torture. This is somebody torture, who's yeah, that's sadistic. Exactly who actually enjoys this you hit it on the head when you said without natural affection when you told me about you curled up begging for your life begging for mercy and your mother looking at you and being more enraged instead of being like what am i doing that's the natural affection that's not something a normal person is capable of yeah that's not something a normal person is capable of. That is the type of behavior that my dad has always preached is something that resembles that of a reprobate and mm-hmm. modern and modern secular psychology would call a sociopath. Somebody that my mom at no point ever showed any feeling or a morsel thing. Obviously, years later, she's like, oh, I'm sorry I did that. Obviously not stopping. So she was really sorry. But at the time, she has never appeared to have any empathy towards any of her children. That is not normal human behavior. That is not the behavior of somebody who is psychologically well. That is very bad. That is very wrong. That is a very evil, twisted, deranged mind right there. The things that she would do. And in addition to the physical abuse, the emotional, mental abuse was nonstop. She degrades her kids. She insults her kids. She attacks her kids, calls her kids names. I have never in my life had somebody say things to me that were even half as like, hurtful like the worst things that have ever been said to me were said to me by my mom and that was so constant and when you're a little kid you derive so much of your like sense of self-worth your self-image you derive all of that from your parents and this was something I spoke to my mom about as an adult I was like hey like you are calling she she would tell her daughters that were 14 15 16 17 
they would be they would upset her because she felt they weren't doing enough work on the house and she would start yelling at them and she would start telling them they're ugly and no guy is ever going to want to date them and that is that is absurd and that is so harmful that is so damaging to their psyche and i would call her on that but why are you doing that and she even said to me at during the last interaction i said hey you are going to degrade her you're going to destroy her sense of self-worth and she said that's my goal Because she very much wanted – both of my parents are people that are extremely narcissistic and obsessed with themselves, and they are obsessed with control. So they wanted to have absolute control of their kids, and as a little kid, you definitely believe that. And especially with how sheltered I was as a little kid, I was homeschooled, so I had no other adult role models in my life. I was going to the church, which was an echo chamber of my parents' opinions, and anybody mm -hmm. who believed something different than my parents or questioned their opinions was kicked out and ostracized. And then I never saw a movie until the age of 10. So yes, as, an old, as a teenager, starting at around 14, my parents did relax a lot on their rules, and pretty, now – At home, my siblings are allowed to listen to any music, any movies. I remember getting beaten when I was 12 for listening to 80s rock and pop music. And my parents now listen to those same songs they've been before. So they have also changed their viewpoints a lot over the years. But while they were getting more relaxed on and pretty much allowing whatever in their home when it came to movies, TV, music – Their, their home became extremely de-Christianized. I have not – like as a little kid, we had family Bible time, and we were also expected to read the Bible on our own. That is not something that I saw at home for my last few years there, and that is not something that I have ever seen or witnessed, and I've asked my siblings, and that is not something. That, so their home – what's, what's interesting is like they're preaching this high standard of morality, but mm -hmm. my parents' home was slowly becoming more and more and more de-Christianized, and obviously I think that they should be – Kids should be allowed to just like listen to regular music or watch regular movies within moderation, within reason. But they changed that opinion vastly over the years, but they were constantly – they never stopped the abuse. So at the point it is right now, my siblings are not being held to biblical standards or even like my little siblings as young as like 11, 12 are – watching R-rated movies at home, listening to explicit music, which is stuff my dad will publicly go against, well, and they're I being allowed to do that. But then that's something that the congregants and the public would, would be interested right, in knowing right. that, that, because that is he preaches a, a very high standard. And I can tell right. you, as a congregational member, we, uh, we aspired to reach that standard. Sometimes right. I say to my fault, I was, you know, I have changed some of my views on things, on standards, and what is important and what is not. And that was heavily influenced, though, I can tell you, to a negative, probably, um, in our home at that time, by what I thought they were doing, you know? Right. Because so then... I thought, this is how you serve God. Look at these people. They can do it. I can do it. We're going right. to do this. And we were very strict. But then, so we think, of course, at home, they are as well in the same way. They also preached against all of this kind of child abuse like i heard it like he would say yes you spank but you never use this force you never do it out of anger i remember him preaching a whole sermon with um, one of the children on his hip and i thought how endearing that is and this family has it together you know and going by biblical standards but i think a lot of people would be very interested to know that not at, at home There is no standard of music of actually watching these, even to R-rated movies. That's even extreme by worldly standards for children, right. you know. And I, I know that you mentioned it during your teenage years. There was a really lack of supervision for you. So there were days at a time when you were gone and off doing whatever and your mother or father did either not care or was this against their rules or Were they just, how did that happen? And so, and how did they, yes. how, how did they uh, instruct you to portray your image to the other church members? Because obviously other church members shouldn't be knowing this. Did they tell you, Hey, you can't be letting them know how we're at home. Did they actually so give you any my, guidance on that? My family had these very strict rules up until I was about 14, around 14 and 15, All of those rules just kind of started going away because my parents just very much could not keep up with their kids, could not handle their kids. They had yeah, more kids they could handle. Many. That's right. So the a logistics abuse, thing. Yeah. 
the abuse so. never stopped, but it was, but the standards dropped dramatic dramatically and it kind of reached a point where i was not i was not allowed to be friends with people from church at all like well i was i was encouraged not to be friends with people from church and i was encouraged to hey if you see him at church smile greet him say hi but don't talk about i was never allowed to talk about movie there was a strict rule that we were not allowed to mention any movie we watched to any church people we were not allowed to mention any music we listened to to any church people and I was not allowed to have any social media because they were worried about how to affect their image. I was not allowed to text or call anyone from the church. And kind of the re reason for that was, is they were very much like, we don't care what you do with your worldly friends. Because I did, when I got into being a teenager and like, I started like working jobs, I made a lot of friends like through lifeguarding and et cetera. And those friends, I was allowed to do whatever I wanted with them. They never really monitored that. Yeah, me and my brother, we'd go on these trips and we'd leave for days, three days at a time. And it was kind of like, hey, do whatever you, you want to do as long as nobody at church finds out about it. Because they, they really weren't worried about enforcing rules or how they raised us. They were just worried about how they would be por portrayed towards church. But I want to make the important distinction that even while their rules were relaxing up and their standards were relaxing – the abuse was still very prevalent because the abuse wasn't based on rules or standards. The abuse was based on was based on rage and personal problems with them. Absolutely, that you hit it. I was about to say that that the abuse never was about enforcing it was yeah. or punishment or anything. It was simply rage. And I, you know, having twelve kids must be very overwhelming and stressful in and of itself, and only us you know it would be very hard to manage yeah. that but but then my dad this, would teach I people that was... it would be a sin to not yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. that's a good point well so he was yeah. teaching people to have more kids than they could handle and he's like well i yeah. have that and it works out fine well no it wasn't working out fine mm -hmm. and how many people i wonder had more kids than they could handle because they yeah. looked at him and thought well that's possible and he would lie to people and say the bible says that you must when that is found nowhere in the bible that you must have as many kids as humanly possible no it says that children are a blessing and a and a reward and gift from god and i personally do not believe in birth control as as a form that could end a pregnancy but there are natural god gave us natural ways to space children out and to if you are not somebody who likes children, the last thing you should do is is commit to a man who wants to have 12 of them. So, right. I, you know, I wonder, you know, and I have thought about this so much lately that um, just what how their difference of background affected their marriage and the outcomes for you. And um, I was talking to Monica about the concept of being unequally yoked um, and how quickly your your family, your dad and mom got married and decided to start having a family. Um, your mom, as far as I know, I don't know the whole story, was not a, um, was not a saved Christian when he met her. Mm -hmm. So um, and he was someone who was out on a missions trip are already brought up and on fire for doing the work of the Lord but he needed a wife, right? And so that unequally, because I do consider that to be unequally yoked. One is very much, very much a, not a baby Christian. And she questionably even was saved at the time of their marriage, right? So, and she might have not even wanted to have that big family. So I think it's a point that when we hold that up as the standard, and again, him not being qualified because of his home life. You know, so what do you think about that? Do you think that your parents loved each other? Did they have a good marriage? How was that growing up? Because I think that's an important part of us raising our children is to show a healthy, loving marriage to them. And yeah, they they were constantly fighting growing up. I never I never really got the idea that they genuinely genuinely like loved or cut of each other there were very few positive interactions between them they were always fighting they were always mad at each other and kind of something that's interesting is later when I was an adult my mom decided at one point uh, a couple months after I moved out of the house 
that she wanted to get a divorce from my dad and she wanted to separate from him and she wanted to press charges on him for years of domestic violence. And I'm sure this is something she'll deny to my dad, but I guess my dad, he can ask my other siblings because she went to her five oldest kids and basically to all of them was like, trying to paint this picture of my dad being a bad person, which obviously he is, but she wanted us to go to court and testify against my dad for spousal abuse and child abuse. And, and she told me, and, and we, and the kind of what the, what the same thing all the solar was like, well, if you want us to go to court and testify, we're going to testify against both of you guys. You can't expect us to testify against one parent and not the other, especially when the acts of child abuse you committed were objectively much worse and much more common. So then my mom, she told me, she said that within her first week of marriage or month of marriage or very soon after marriage, she said it was he was so abusive towards her that she wanted to kill herself. And I said, and that was before you were even pregnant with Solomon. And she said, yes. And I said, so then why did you bring 12 kids into that relationship? If she was alleging that he was physically abusive from day one, then it's like, yeah. well, why did you make the decision to bring 12 kids into that relationship? Because if you've been married for a month and you don't have any kids or somebody, it's not that difficult to get out of that. Obviously, emotionally, mentally, it's very difficult. But like physically speaking, right. she could have gotten a divorce somewhat easily, much more easily than now when she has 12 kids with him and has been married to him for 20 some years and now is not does not really have a way to support that family on her own so eventually she kind of dropped that issue because none of my siblings were willing to testify against my dad without testifying against her as well and she obviously does not have the financial means to support that many kids because she has not ever worked a job in america has not been in the job market since the 90s then she really can't support those kids mm -hmm. but my mom very much hated my dad she she told oh, she, she told me this like on multiple occasions, years apart, about how often she would pray that he would die because she felt like that was like the best outcome. She's like, well, if he dies, because the other thing was she didn't want to discredit his ministry. Mm -hmm. So she was kind of hoping he would die before anything came out like it is now. So then that way he would die, whatever. She wouldn't have to deal with him. She would get a life insurance. Problem. She, she, she told that to multiple of my siblings, like, and my dad, even if he's going to watch this, he remembers, I remember them fighting because she said it to his face one day. Well, dad, she kept saying that for years after, and she would tell it to me about how she prays that he would die so that she wouldn't have to do it anymore. Now, my mom was very physically heavily abused. I guess that segues into that is, yeah, my dad um, my mom says that, that the abuse started at the very beginning of her marriage and it was kind of in the sense of when they would fight, he would hit her, you know, a punch, a slap, whatever. But for a several year period, kind of concurrent with when the child abuse was at its worst, my dad was very abusive to my mom in the sense that it wasn't just, it was, it, it wasn't even like, he got mad, lost his temper and hit her. It would be, he used the same electrical cord on her that he would use on us. And it would be like, well, you disrespected me. You talked back to me. He very much, my dad's an extreme narcissist, extremely has a God complex. Mm -hmm. He never does anything wrong in his mind. I've never once heard him apologize to like one of his kids or to my mom or anything. He, he did what he did and was not sorry. Could never be wrong. Nobody could ever question him. And he would then beat my mom with the electrical cord of like, okay, well, you're going to talk back. And he even, I guess, had some kind of a system for, uh, he had like a system of like, this infraction is this. Because I remember this one day he was like tallying it up because he like couldn't do it at the moment. He's like, well, that's three. He's like, I'm going to write this down. Three more for talking back, five more for this one. And just like, and then he would beat, beat her very very badly as well and like that electric cord left these really wow. bad marks and I remember seeing those same marks on my mom and yeah that was something he did for years now to all of the people that say oh your mom isn't bad she was just in this abusive environment so she was abusive as well I am I am sure that my mom's abuse she endured as a child and the abuse she endured at from my father are a large contributor if not the reason why she was abusive to her children but every adult 
is responsible for their own actions and it doesn't matter what made her an evil sadistic person she is still an evil sadistic person who deserves to be punished for what she has done she deserves to go to jail and she should not have access to her children it's unfortunate that she became that type of a person because she was abused but that does not make her any less guilty or any less somebody that should not be trusted with children and should but face the consequences of their actions. My dad, I know, had a meeting with members from his church where he addressed these allegations, basically, because people were asking him, and he denied it all. He said that he has never hit my mom. He said that he has never um, hit my siblings in the way I'm telling the story now. Like I said, the Bible says to take anything at the mouth of two or three witnesses, and you can ask my brothers and they will tell you like yeah like i my dad beat my mom and like yeah and then i'm sure that as more and more of my kids because right now three out of three of my dad's adult children will say and be like yeah and if you ask them like yeah he did all these things so i'm sure that as more and more of his kids become adults and are no longer under his control like obviously if you ask the kids at home they're not going to be able to be honest because yeah. for fear of their own safety but if you ask any of his adult kids any of the kids that no longer live with him they will tell you the truth on this and they can back up these facts. So then the Bible, he's clearly disqualified, right? From being a pastor because of these things. And he knows he's disqualified because if he wasn't disqualified, he wouldn't feel the need to lie about it. So as a church member, hear my testimony, talk to my brothers. They're not publicly talking about this, but if you personally know them, if you go to the church, ask them, give them a call, shoot them a text, ask them about these things. They can corroborate these details and you can make that decision for yourself, whether or not this is a reliable account, whether or not this is a reliable story. And then ask yourself the question of, you have a pastor that is disqualified, knows he's disqualified, and then gets up in front of his congregation and lies to his congregation blatantly knowingly my dad knows for a fact he beat his wife for years i know for a fact he beat his wife for years so the fact that he is willing to lie to his congregation then that begs the question of well how much of his message does he really believe because the bible clearly states and he has clearly preached many many times about the kind of curses that god puts on somebody oh, who, I as a man him. of god knowingly lies Last night, last night, he literally said it was a, another veiled um, sermon with a couple little nuggets thrown in there for you. And, and it, it was it was threatening, you know, that you should fear God. He's, you know, yeah, whatever. And my dad, do, has, no, my dad has no fear of God. You should I, fear God. He's going to kill you. And I, 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 text... I remember what you had said, that he told you all his life or all your life that you need to. God's going to strike you dead. Like yep, my, my dad would tell me that God minor would kill me if I did things to bad. But I texted him, my dad. This is like the only thing I texted him is I sent him after that meeting. I said, hey, I heard you lied about in that meeting. I was like, I know you lied. You know you lied. And you know you're disqualified because if you didn't think that disqualified you, you wouldn't have had to lie. And you clearly don't believe your message. You clearly yeah. don't believe your own witness because then you would know what God's going to do to you. So I have a couple theories about why he's lying and doing that. My number one theory is that he believes that he is doing all this good for God and he's blah, blah, blah. So he's like, well, if I don't lie to the congregation, it's going to do more harm to God's cause in the end because of the fact that he's like, it'll, It'll turn people with Christ. So he's like, I'm doing the right thing for God by lying. That's what I think the most. Sense. But but his preaching, I think very what much turns, he preaches yeah, he preaches wrong, wicked, absurd things that are not in the Bible, and then says they're in the Bible, and then that makes Christians look really bad and makes the Bible look yeah. bad. When he preaches and has numerously times preached that it is okay to rape somebody if you're married, and that it's not rape if you're married and all of that. And that is an absurd thing to preach. And then that makes Christians look bad. all of those mm -hmm. other things he teaches. He has his blatantly misogynistic, blatantly sexist views. And my dad claims to be neither of those things. I will tell you as somebody who knows him extremely well, he very much is a misogynist and a sexist. And my mom, not my dad, my dad's not a racist, but my mom openly admits to being a racist to her kids and that's something i argued with her a lot about as an adult like oh well that's wrong she's like i'm a racist and she does not make any attempt to hide that she openly admits that 
So I think that that's my number my, – the number one reason why I think my dad would be lying. Number two reason is if he truly just does not believe anything – that he says, and he's just a plant of the devil to discredit Christians and make Christians and Baptists and fundamentalists look bad. And then number three, my dad has a lot of college degrees. My dad is enrolled in ASU right now. Church, basically the last few years of my dad's ministry, church has his, all of his time he would spend working for the church, he just spent in college. So he has gained like a master's degree, multiple bachelor's degrees, and the degrees were being paid for by the church. But also, that's all he would work on. So he, the only thing I would see my dad ever doing for the church, he would preach, he would make content, but other than that, he was just getting paid to go to college. And I think that now that he has all those degrees, he wow. could get a job in a secular environment so i think that he might know he's done for at this point and he's just lying to the congregation as a way to like stall for time until he can get a job and then resign because it's like yeah. as more and more of that you can't keep yeah, the truth secret stop it. forever yeah. at no, this point the there's too much and i think that that is very ab abundantly clear right. like and we and, even when we had our issues we didn't go there were children still involved. Like we were trying with our, our actual, we didn't know about the abuse at your house, you know, to the extent that you are talking about, we all had suspicions, you know, and I had heard little things here and there, but I didn't have any clue of the, the magnitude of it. But when he didn't resign, then I knew that something was wrong because actually when that all came out I was grieved I was like wow this man of God because I still trusted him and trusted the church to be legit and I was like he's how sad for him he's going to have to step down you know and that's going to be really hard for him and hard for the church but see that's how you run a church if you actually believe what you're saying and you actually care for the cause of Christ when something comes up you handle it with biblically and you humble yourself and you say at this moment, I'm not qualified to run this church anymore. I step down. Someone else steps in and the cause of Christ continues and it's actually honored because you're honoring the Bible. So what he is doing and the people who think that it's hurting the name of Christ for you to come out and be truthful and for something to happen to him. It's actually honoring God, you know? So. Yeah. And, and I think that that is, I want to make it very clear that I believe there are a lot of good people in that church and in that movement. And I think that my dad deceived a lot of people about the kind of person he was and he garnered that big following. But I would think that I think that what's going to happen with this is it is going to sort out the good people from the bad people. And I think that he yeah. has attracted a lot of people that are abusive and yeah. narcissistic like himself. And that's why they like him. And I think that those are going to be the types of people that stay in his church. And then the people that leave are going to people that are good people that can see that this is wrong are going to leave. And then I think that if the church doesn't, you know, remove him as pastor and get a new pastor and begin healing then I think that the church is just going to go downhill very quickly. Yeah. And well, God and in, is not going to bless time, an unqualified pastor. And absolutely. another another issue, by the way, is <laughs> somebody just asked me about this. And like I forgot about this. But my dad is like publicly attacked pastor and says not a valid church or a valid pastor if you're not ordained. My dad has never been ordained. Oh, yeah. That's always been a controversy, like, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, no. So he's never been ordained. So. And he has publicly attacked a lot of people for being ordained. And he never had a public ordination. But he claims that his pastor in a private one-on-one -on -one conversation yeah. ordained him. Yeah. But that pastor has since come forward and said that he mm -hmm. did not that's ordain right. my dad. And he told my dad he would not ordain him. Right. So that's so why ordinations was... are supposed to be a public service. But he... Right very hypocritically attacks other pastors for not being ordained when he himself was never formally ordained. Yeah. 
he's disqualified on on many levels and and and, and his whole thing about yeah. he left so. he left bible college a week before graduating and i find that really interesting because he said he left because of doctrinal issues he couldn't like he yeah. didn't feel good morally going to Bible college, so he left. So why would you leave your Bible college after spending thousands of dollars? You leave a week before graduation because of a moral issue. But what's funny now is my dad is actively enrolled at ASU. And anybody who knows anything about ASU <laughs> knows that it's the number one college in the U.S. for STDs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to say number one cocaine-consuming uh. college in the U.S. And it's on, like, the top ten for alcohol-consuming colleges. So my dad clearly does not have an issue with the moral standpoints of organizations he goes to. ASU also, they're, they're, they officially, whatever, that school – promotes all kinds oh. of things he disagrees with very much much more than a bible college so he claims he left his bible wow. college a week before getting a degree because of an For issue with zionism mm -hmm. but now he has no problem going to a college that openly supports mm -hmm. the lgbt agenda <laughs> number one cocaine consuming <laughs> no. college number one std wow. college so it's like that's some like that makes me ask myself, well, did he really leave Bible college or was there more to that situation than he's being honest about? Because clearly he is somebody that is willing to lie to his congregation. And we can all now see that he has no intrinsic core values and he is willing to do whatever to protect his power and to protect his role that he very much enjoys having of being an influential pastor because my dad is somebody who's obsessed with control and obsessed with power and he gets that dose of control and power through his ministry mm -hmm. yep john i have a question i just want to kind of close the abuse portion and ask you um how did you kids cope during this time, did you um, find so, seek solace in one another? Was there, was there a family member that you could turn to? Was there anybody you said you? So it sounds like you were all very isolated. And um, how how was? Yeah, what, I mean, mm -hmm. I th I think we turned to each other and like would kind of like empathize with with each other and be like, man, like that really sucks that that happened. But the really really the most painful part of it all, and is we were taught from a young age that that was okay. And then that creates such like inward tumult of like knowing it's wrong because we all kind of know what's right and wrong, mm -hmm. but then believing what, but it's like, well, my, my parents say this is God's word. And like my parents say when I'm older, it'll all make sense and I'll understand and my parents can do no wrong and et cetera. And then that creates that like really difficult struggle. So as a child, I was, was like, well, I guess this is just, what it's like being a kid, and I guess this is normal. I very much thought it was normal. And as I became an adult, I realized how much they were lying to me. And as an old teenager, I realized how much they were lying to me. And how evil and wrong and sadistic all that stuff was as I got older. But I just very much did not want to accept that my parents were horrible people. So, yeah, I tried to explain it away. And I tried to tell myself, well, good people do bad things up until only a couple of weeks ago. And it, that was the hardest thing I've ever had to do to acknowledge that my parents are evil, bad, wicked people because you you want to have parents. You want to believe that your parents are good people. And when you acknowledge to yourself and when you consciously realize that your parents are evil people that do not love you, do not care for you, then you are in a way losing them. And you try to explain away all of the bad and you try to explain away all of those bad moments in order to hold on to – those positive aspects. And that's the big difference between my mom and dad is my mom was extremely rarely positive. My dad, normally, most of his interactions with his kids were positive. I would say for my mom, it was about 90% of the time that po the interactions were negative, 10% positive. My dad was 90% positive, 10% negative. Mm -hmm. And wow. that very much would then be like, it's, it's very hard to accept that. But at some point, and I, I'm not doing this for myself, you know, I am safe right now. I am happy right now. And I have worked yeah. through everything that I have had to go through. But now it's not about myself. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this for two reasons. Number one, for my younger siblings still living in that environment, because I know how harmful it is. I know how bad it is. I know how much every single day hurts and is painful and sucks. And I'm doing it to because I know and, and I talk to like my younger siblings and like I see the effect it has on them. They are very unhappy. They're very depressed. They're very upset. And that's not normal for a little kid. You know, a six, seven year old should not be depressed and angry and whatever. And like, hey, 
I shouldn't be starting till you're like 16 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but like, but like, you shouldn't have like some like angsty emo 16 year old. I mean, not, not an angsty emo <laughs> like six year old. Like, that's right. not normal. Right, exactly. So, so I'm doing it they... to get them out of that environment and I'm doing it to expose my dad to the people of his church the good people so they can kind of know the type of person they are listening to so they don't go home and do the same things and listen to his preaching and follow his advice. And then, cause I'm sure that there are other women in that church that have been physically abused. I'm sure that there are plenty of other kids in that church that have been physically abused. Mm -hmm. And I am trying to make it very clear that my dad is not a good person. My mom are not, is not a good person. They are not people that should be listened to or trusted. And to my siblings, I'm doing this as a way to help them through that because i firsthand know how difficult it is and then thirdly to any kids that are in similar situations that might be seeing this whether they are within my dad's church or movement or just any canadian situation hey i know how difficult that is i know how bad it is and i put the offer out there in my last two interviews and yeah like i am somebody that might you can always contact me reach out to me and if you have questions if you're concerned like I will talk to you about that. I'm happy to support anyone I can who's going through something similar because the worst part of being abused is the feeling of isolation right. and the feeling of helplessness. And I want to provide that support and that listening ear and that advice and compassion to anyone in a similar situation. Mm -hmm. And to all the people that have are attacking me online because of my appearance and because of things, so first of all, a lot of the accusations that have been made against me that I drink alcohol, do drugs are not true. I right. have not, I am currently completely sober and I have been completely sober for some time. And the Bible, and as far as piercings, everybody got mad at me for my piercings. I don't even know why that like trigger people so much. The Bible like repeatedly brings up piercings, it brings up nose rings, earrings, all that stuff, but it never says they're a sin. So if you want to say that piercings are a sin, well, that is teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. If you mm -hmm. think it's wrong that I have tattoos, well, I think we just have two different personal opinions. I think that that was an Old Testament thing. If you think that's still a New Testament thing, hey, that's okay. I agree to disagree. But your opinion on me as a person, I am still a Christian. I still very much have faith. I still read the Bible. I still listen to other preachers. And I still live Christ's method, message of loving God and loving your neighbor. And it shouldn't matter who I am. If what I'm saying is true, then it's true. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wanted to Absolutely. ask, too, about your education. How do you feel uh, being homeschooled? And I homeschool my kids. Laura is going to homeschool her five-year-old or started. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about your education? And how, how was your mom uh, as a teacher in the in the home? Do you feel you – you seem extremely intelligent. So uh, what do you think about the education you received? Oh, I, I, would, I wouldn't say extremely intelligent, but, but thank would. you. Um I think that it very much depended on the kids. So my mom could not keep up with all of her kids and track all of her kids. Sure. So I do know that the education varies wildly between her kids. And I feel as though I got a decent, I feel as though I got a good education. When I was 16 years old, I was enrolled in college with a 4.0 GPA when I went to a um, higher education after that in the medical field. That is something that I scored over 90% in the class, got a perfect score on my state exam. And, I, and I don't, I'm not saying that to brag, mm -hmm. but like, like I feel as though I got a good education, but that's because as a kid, I was always very interested in my education and I always made sure to pay attention to it. But the other kids who kind of weren't as, I guess, nerdy as kids, <laughs> they would then slack off more and my mom couldn't keep up with it. So yeah. I know that all throughout the kids, they were, they, were, they were always weeks and weeks behind on their lessons. Mm -hmm. They were – cheating was rampant because my mom was having the kids score their own work. as yeah. like, like seven, eight, nine-year-olds are scoring their own schoolwork because <laughs> my mom won't do it all because she, number one, had too many kids and number two, right. is very lazy. So I think that a lot of the kids are not going to get a good education. I think that a couple of them will if they really choose to and really work for it. But most kids are not going to naturally 
have that desire to pursue that education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a quick question about the scandals in the church. Um, how did those scandals, uh, if you remember, how did they affect the home life? How, how did they affect their relationship? Would people just blow up when they got home uh, or, or did it affect the home life at all? If you even remember. Um, that scandal obviously had nothing to do with my family. So I don't think that one affected my home life at all. People coming home and blowing up and being mad. Well, that was constant. So like, there wasn't like my mom's more mad than usual because of scandal. No, she was just always really mad, always blowing up, freaking out. Uh, my dad usually wasn't, he wasn't like screaming, yelling at us on a daily basis. That was pretty rare. So yeah, that did, that type of thing that didn't like have an effect on the family wouldn't really affect us. But I know that one thing that was like really triggering to my dad was if he felt we were making him look bad to the church. And that would be something where like, if we did something wrong and church people found out or church people complained about us, we got absolutely smoked at home because he was very interested in preserving him his image. So if it was a scandal that at all involved us, had to do with us, yeah, we we paid for it big time. We we got hit pretty hard for that. Um, if it didn't involve the family, then it didn't really have that much effect, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for answering that. Um, so the qualifications of a pastor, a bishop, I think First Timothy 3, 1 through 5 goes through I can that. I'm going to screen share, maybe, and you guys can see it. I have it. Hold on. I think this is important for the congregation and for the churches, his satellite churches, um, and for the people sitting in his church and listening to him and, and thinking he, is, he should be up there um, professing the word of God. Um, so First Timothy 3, 1 through 5 um, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, no, not greedy of filth, filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And I hate to say, but there are um, a couple things in here that your dad um according to your testimony is he is a striker. He is not patient. He seems to be a baller. He does not rule his house. Well, his children are not in subject him because of that. Um, I don't think it's by any means the children. I think it's the parents, obviously by the sound of it. Um, what, what would you, what would be the perfect outcome based on your testimony? If things were to move in a positive way, how would you want this to uh, play out in terms of your dad? Maybe stepping down, choosing somebody else in the church, maybe yeah, getting my, counseling. Yeah, my, da my dad's completely unfit to pastor. Yeah. That's that's pretty clear. That's pretty apparent. And the thing about pastoral qualifications are it's not a thing of, okay, well, I fixed this so I can be a pastor now. It's a thing of if you yeah. do them, you're disqualified. These are permanent disqualifications. And he needs to recognize that and step down as pastor. And if he is not doing that, then that is just showing that he is not in it for the right reasons. He is not in it because he wants to do the right thing for God. And he's not in it for the church because if he was, then he'd be following God's standards for it. He clearly is in this with other intentions and other motivations. Does he seek the, um, the advice of his deacons or of any of the gentlemen there that are within the inner circle, does he uh, seek their advice or vote on things with them in terms of how the church runs? Or is he the dictator? <laughs> he, he himself, he says that the church is a dictatorship and he's in charge and nobody else is in charge. Um, I don't know how much advice he gets from them behind closed doors, but like I have brought up a couple of times in this interview my dad is an extremely narcissistic person so i can't imagine he puts that much thought or weight to the advice and opinions of others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are your siblings still all attending the ones that are living in the house do they still all attend the church i guess they'd the, have to right yeah they yeah they they have to they don't have a choice about that <laughs>
And how about your older brothers? Um, I believe Isaac is still attending. I don't believe Solomon is. I'm not 100% sure. And I, I don't know the full situation with that. John, what what would you ideally want to happen right now um, with your testimony coming out uh, for the world to Man, see I, uh, with with the I'd siblings? like, to, I'd like with the your government siblings. to do their job and I'd like him to step in and intervene. Um, I understand that the foster care system is far from perfect, but I believe that as somebody who lived in that house firsthand, it is, I was physically, emotionally, mentally abused on a, a very frequently on a daily basis. You know, I constantly had marks, constantly was in pain, constantly felt scared and stressed. And in the many stressful situations I have faced as an adult, which I have had plenty of that, um, I have never felt one tenth of the stress that I felt on a daily basis as living as a little kid living at home. And I think that that, you know, CPTSD and other issues that that can cause, I think that that environment is not a good environment for them. And as much as I would like to believe that, whoa, well, my kids can, that not my, whoa, well, that my parents can change and get counseling and get help. And as cool as that sounds, like, let's be honest, if you have a couple people in their 40s that have been doing this for over 20 years, they're not changing anytime soon. They are who they are. Right. But yeah, CPS So, has been contacted and that yeah. is being dealt with on that end. Yeah. I wanted to ask something about that. I remember your mom talking about her relationship with the Tempe Police Department and then she'd go on ride alongs frequently. Uh, she had mentioned that in a vlog. And I was wondering, do you think she has like an in with the city, you know, to where they give them kind of a free ticket out of trouble because of that relationship she established My with mom, the police my department? mom's never been on a ride along with the police department. I, I don't think the cops like my mom very much. Like, like I don't, I don't have any like, I she's never been on a ride along. Did she say that? Yeah, she said that in a vlog. When? I, I distinctly remember, oh, it was years ago uh, when That's so weird. I was part of the church. Because I distinctly remember thinking, well, I want to I want to do a ride along too. I want Yeah, to get in good how with do these you get? guys. I'll ride along in an <laughs> ambulance. you uh, Yeah. you go, you go contact if you like go on like any like. department's website whether that's fire ems police like and you want to do a ride-along you can request that but my mom has never been on a police ride-along if, if she said that that's that's really weird um if she always acts like she's like so like in cool with those people and she's like yeah like the cops came but yeah we, we're, we have really good stuff like i as far as i know like i don't think they like her very much i think they're tired of showing up to her house for dumb crap You know, like, so I wouldn't, I don't see them liking her. Um, what you gotta understand is that with CPS is they're a very limited organization of, they get sued a lot and they get attacked a lot. So I think that that would be why nothing has happened yet. And there is also a. Then they're going to go tell on me to the authorities and then I'm going to get in all this trouble or, you know, whatever, get, get, get the CPS or whatever. I don't know. What, what is it called in Arizona? CPS, DSS, DCS, CPS. It's called different things in different places. I believe it's called CPS here, you know. But, but here's the thing about that is. One time I was going there for the meat buy. Remember when your mom used to do the meat buys, the beef buys? <laughs> and he here I am, like, I I'm thinking, I, for years, I just said, Zhuja can do no wrong. She is perfection. I mean, I really thought she was like an angel. I, I She just was an angel to me because I did. I wasn't on social media, so I didn't, I wasn't privy to how she was with other people from within the church. She barely talked to me. I just thought, wow, her kids are just behaved. They don't smile very much, but they're well behaved. And, you know, the, they, the husband and her seem to love each other. So I went there for to grab my beef. And I think I had some some cookies or something for you guys in a game. And I'm walking up to the door. <laughs> I'll never forget it because I came home telling my husband, like, I'm not sure what I heard. I heard a primal scream come out of your mom's mouth. I've never heard anything like it before in my life. It was That before sounds I hit like the her. it, it was before I hit the door and I thought, oh my god, like am I walking into like a scene? I you know, I was I was scared. No, So she's she's very psychotic. wow. That that's pretty regular for her to just be screaming at the top of her lungs. I mean, at the top of her lungs, like, like Yep. bloody murder. Dude, It was and like it would bloody and it would murder. be so annoying to listen to, just like shut up. Right. I could totally just nonstop. see that.
but that's kind of the break in the facade and that's that very I said. that's very physically triggering like to Oh, like yeah. your body releases hormones and your brain has a certain physical response to that kind of stimulus and when you're having that on a constant basis like yeah that's gonna very much affect you Yeah, I could totally see that. I came home, I told my husband, and he he almost didn't believe me. He said, it, it, it it's must, pretty it, unbelievable. it's pretty unbelievable it is unbelievable. that you have a It grown is unbelievable. woman in her 40s screaming at the top of her lungs, but no, that was a daily occurrence for her. She like screamed like, ah! and it, like screaming your name, and you're like, what? She's like, get me a cup of water, and it's like, Oh my gosh. Wow. you have two legs, walk yourself to the water cooler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my. I wanted to, uh, Laura, if you wanted to discuss the fruits of the spirit, and then I wanted to Oh, just we can. ask John in the end one more question. Yeah, I did want to ask a couple more questions about just the emotional abuse. And I, I hate to keep going back to the abuse, but I do want these things to be something that followers of Zhuja and and Stephen, especially Zhuja, because we're, we were all looking to her as the perfect mother. And we're We were. as mothers, our goal is to raise children who love the Lord, first of all, who love each other and who feel loved, you know, and who are safe. Those are your goals as a mother and for them to be happy. You want that. But um, I know that you have mentioned this, but I just want you to I'm going to ask you the question. Did you feel loved growing up? And do you think your your brothers and sisters feel loved by your mom? How often did she say she loved you? Did she hug you? Does she cuddle with the little ones? And then the same questions for your dad. I I think that so for my mom I very much did not feel loved and I actually remember I had this I remember I would go to and my mom me and my brother actually had this conversation of like who are like the kids who my mom dislikes the least and we came up with three kids me and one sister one brother We kind of like agree like yeah those are like the three that always kind of like seem to get it the worst and like the most and that personality issue and like I very much was aware that my mom did not love me did not like me growing up and that's something I felt every day and I remember more times than I can count you know crying myself to sleep and I just thinking like why doesn't she like me why doesn't she love me and I remember I even had this thought of like as a little kid thinking about how long it would be till I was an adult and like how many years was till I was 18 and thinking to myself, okay, that's how much time I have left to make her like me. And this sense of anxiety about becoming an adult before I was able to like convince her to like me, convince her to love me. So like with like babies and toddlers, my mom is pretty affectionate with them. But as a kid, my mom never like that I can remember like with like her babies they're like one two three years old she's she'll cuddle them hug them whatever but not that I can remember so it must have it either wasn't happening or was happening when I was that age so I wouldn't remember obviously but maybe once twice giving me a hug very rare to say I love you that did change when I became an adult and then like as an adult she would say I love you more and like give me a hug when I would come over, but like that was not ever as a child. Same with my dad. I I'm thinking of one instance off the top of my head with my dad's where my dad said, I love you. Um, can't really think of any time my dad ever like gave me a hug as a kid, something like that. Uh, I did, I did feel like my dad actually cared about me more because like my dad would like ask me about my job, ask me about like when I was in college and other education he would like ask me about that ask me how it was he liked hearing stories from my work and like he would take us traveling but, like my mom very much if I would try I'd try to tell my mom a story and like I'd be like talking and then just like in the middle of like I'm mid-sentence she was like walk away and start talking to somebody else like like she's like I'm like oh like and like very much Or just, like, I'd be, like, talking, and I would just, like, get the sense that she wasn't listening, and I'd just, like, stop talking mid-sentence, and she, like, wouldn't say anything or, like, react at all. Like, oh, she hasn't been listening. Um, she would, like, go on all these family vacations, and I never got invited to any of them. <laughs> like, she, she would go to, like, Germany, New York, all over the country, and she'd, like, take all my siblings, and, like, she never took me. 
Like I've never been on one of those vacations. The only vacation, like I would go on like trips with my dad, to, like church would pay for like when we were going to preach, but I've never like been on like a vacation outside of like California where we, I'd always like ask her to take me and, and she would be like, well, well that's entitled. Like I don't have to take you just cause I take them. And she was kind of like, you can go, but you have to pay for yourself. But then she was like paying for everyone else. So like, I, I, I don't know what was up with that. And I mean, like, that's obviously not abusive. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little but bit. But it's just um, like, it just kinda, it just kind of, it just kind of shows like, it shows the type of person loving. she is. It's neglectful right. is what it is. Yeah. It's, neglectful. it's mean. It's, it's just, it's just a little bit mean. So it's it like, especially it's because. It's not a motherly up, thing to do. Do you want your kids no, to all feel included? Right. It's, yeah. I'm like, well, I have never been on any vacation anywhere other than California. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so that, I guess <laughs> that kind of goes into another question of, you know, one-on-one -on -one time. Is there ever one-on-one -on -one time with the children? It's kind of curious. Um, is your dad much. even home every night? Like, is he home consistently because, or is he just not quite as present? My He's okay. pretty much always and home when he's he... not traveling. Mm. Now, so now his office and not... everything is at home. So he's there at home. Well, he 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 has his his office is at church, but like right. I said, he doesn't really. For the last there for a long time, he worked extremely hard for the church. The last mm -hmm. few years, the only work for the church he does is preach and make a couple of videos. He turns down most speaking engagements. So when he was traveling, he'd always take a kid with him, and usually he would just take one kid. So it was like a rotation, and there was a period See, I think that's, where that's a good when thing. When he was working you have extremely one -on -one hard, yeah, 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 yeah. When he was working extremely hard, traveling every week, there was a rotation of kids. So you would get to go on a trip with my dad every couple of months to go through preach. So there was one one time with my dad, with my mom, not really ever, no. And like there were even times as like when I would like try to like like when I was older when I was like 12, 13, 14, I'd be like, hey mom, and I and I'd like try to like arrange something like, hey, like can I go with you on this errand? Or like, hey, do you want to go with me here? And like it pretty much would never really happen because she had way too many kids to handle mm -hmm. and did not really individually like most of her kids and definitely did not really like me very much mm -hmm. and um well, yeah, as like far you, as like John. teaching so, <laughs> so you know there's a lot of people who really enjoy you and you have you have built I think a community of people what you're doing well that's that's here. a nice thing of you to say I appreciate that 100 percent, 100 percent. but yeah that's um, yeah I, I wanted to um, just ask, since you've gone public and this will be your third interview, and thank you again for being so gracious to give us so much of your time and to just open yourself up to to these questions. Um, what Has anything changed? Have you been contacted by uh, people your age that are in a situation or have been or people that want to hear more from you? I, I read some comments. People say, you know, when are you going to write a book? Um, I, I'm, I hate writing. I'm not writing a book. That's, that's not going to happen. That, okay. Well, there's <laughs> AI. Not writing a book. There's AI. Yeah, for that. you Just, can get I don't, <laughs> ghost I don't know, I don't know yeah. why anybody yeah. would want to spend their free time reading a book about abuse. Um, <laughs> on my last video, I had him like link my Instagram because I don't, I'm not comfortable giving out my number. No. Just publicly. If somebody like sends me a message on there and wants to call me, I'll give him my number, but I'm not public. So if you, if you want to, Put that on here as well. That's that's cool. Um, a Thank lot of you. people reached out that said like, "Hey, I was in a similar situation. Like, I was raised fundamentalist or Catholic, or, or even other things where they were raised in these very religious but also very abusive homes." And talking to them was encouraging for me, and I hope it was encouraging for them as well. And I would say I have gotten a lot of support from people and a lot of people saying nice things, a lot of people also attacking me. And I have gotten attacked a lot for issues with people thinking I'm not a Christian. And I would always be like, and they, they would, they would bring up like the same few things. And there's this like one picture of me that went around, I mean, wearing this one outfit that everybody says I'm not a Christian for and I'm not gonna lie. Okay, I get it. The outfit looks a little gay, but I was at an electronic music festival, and that is what you do. You dress up as kind of like bizarre and crazy as mm -hmm. possible. That's just part of the culture of the event. And with context, that's not gay. 
if that's how I was just dressing to go to the grocery store, I think that would be a valid concern. <laughs> but when I one time dressed up crazy, cause that's, you know, what you do at those types of events. And yeah, like people attacking stuff and, it's, and a lot of it is I'm asking like, well, where specifically is that a sin? Where yeah. specifically does the Bible say that you can't have piercings or like, and, and especially it's like, dude, that's not the point. Like that is right. what the Bible talks about. It's talking about like picking out the moat in someone's eye when there's a beam in your own eye. And it's like being abusive and violent towards your wife and kids is a much more serious issue than wearing a questionable outfit to a music festival or yeah. having yeah. piercings. Well, I think that's a like, common tactic that is used. And I know you, you don't describe it as a cult, but I do actually think that it is a cult there. I think like, I would say a lot of we, people have a cult like view of the organization. Well, we used to say, I used to say, even while I was there, I'm like, well, we're not in a cult, but we sure are surrounded by some cult members. So, that like, that was yeah. a really good way of putting it. I think, I think but, that um, pretty much sums it up. Yeah. A lot of times they attack your personal problem as they did me um and my flaws um so I've gone through that and I've experienced it <laughs> it's hard but you have to just brush it off because and I have to make the point and you I think have made the point it doesn't matter that's not what we're talking about we're not actually here to discuss John John is not a pastor John is not a father you know and um we're not critiquing your your style we're here but talking about actual abuse and even Over if you were, even if you were, all of the things they accuse you of being on drugs and, you know, gay, or if you were those things, you talking about abuse that someone did to you is still legitimate. It still right. means that person needs to be held accountable. And, and you are none of those things. And I, we are so thankful. And that is one thing that we want to put out there is that you are still a very faithful and and growing Christian. And we are so proud of you for living through all of this and separating the I would say um, my faith is stronger the, now than ever since yeah. separating from my dad in that church. Yeah. And I will say the support overwhelmingly, the majority has been positive. And if you are somebody that left a positive comment on the on either or both of the interviews or send me a message. I did, I did read it all. I think I responded to everyone who messaged me and I tried to respond to all the comments, but I read your comment and I appreciate it if you did leave that. And yeah, that has been encouraging, but I have also what's really cool and something I did not at all think would happen when I did this, but I have reconnected with some, some old friends and, that's been that's been good. That's been nice. It's that been nice. <laughs> some people, good. some people I didn't think I was gonna see again. <laughs> yeah. So that was aware. an unexpected <laughs> positive of that. <laughs> Ooh, raise, the roof. Yeah. raise the roof. Raise the roof. We're all here for it. <laughs> I do have one question. It's kind of out of out of line, and you might not want to use it, but I, I'm really curious because I have a theory about what happened to your your mom. Your dad was on a mission in in Germany. And he sees a pretty girl walking down the street and she's busy in her life, feminist, all that school, uh, make money. And he stops her and they end up getting together and he kind of um, abruptly stops her. Her own manifestation of who she wants to be. Uh, and my theory, my my thought is um, maybe she has, you know, anger because she wanted to come to America because she she was curious of how this would play out. Um she she wanted part of this, but she didn't want all of this. Right. And uh, my theory is that maybe your your dad might be a different person if he wouldn't have married her uh, for the better. Um, maybe I don't want to say poison the well, but what, what do you think about that, about my theory? I would I would say that I think that my dad probably started out with good intentions mm -hmm. And I think that he very much is not the person he was or pastor was at the beginning. And like, I think that he, 
Yeah, I think that he very well could have had good intentions at the beginning. You know, he grew up in a good home, went to Bible mm -hmm. college, wanted to be a pastor, wanted to be a missionary from a young age. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I think that he is past the point of no return mm -hmm. with all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As sad as that is to say about my own dad. Yeah. And people yeah. people act like I just want to like go with him. I'm like, this, this is hard for me. You know, like that's my dad. Like this this isn't something that gives me joy to talk about and you know what's interesting is that conversation i had with jordan where i detailed it, that was the first time i've i'd spoken to anyone outside of my family to speak to a lot of those things and like mm -hmm. i had mentioned to people before like yeah i got abused a little bit growing up or like but I very much downplayed it because I didn't want to acknowledge it because I wanted to have that relationship with my parents. And that conversation with Jordan was very was my first time really talking about a lot of that. And this, this isn't something that's easy or positive for me. And like, and I have no motive. What is my motive to want to go in, attack my dad, and cut things? I, I have been cut off completely from my family. There's only Right. Like one of my brothers talks to me right now. A lot, of, a lot of people don't like him. He says a lot of weird stuff. But like, I think I think he's a good dude. Like, I think he just has a lot of weird ideas. And I don't agree with him politically, if anybody knows his political views. But <laughs> he's the only member of my family that still talks to me. And I think he's a nice, good guy. He just has some weird ideas. But he doesn't he's not physically violent to anyone. He doesn't physically act on any of his ideas or beliefs. And we are free as people, and part of freedom is the freedom to be wrong. But yeah, I don't know what people think I would have to gain from making all this up about my dad. Because two weeks ago, I was welcome in their home. Right. I was able to have a relationship with my younger siblings, and that was something that was always really important to me. Was from like from the time I got my driver's license, like I was always taking my younger siblings that were like like the little ones out on day trips, any day I wasn't at work, I would take them to the zoo, take them to Tucson, take them to Flagstaff. And I'm sure that that's something that they're going to miss. And I'm sure that they're going to ask my parents about, Hey, you know, what happened to John? And who knows what they're going to tell them? You know, they're going to tell them that. And I would, would have them bring my siblings, my job to show them what I do and like try to be a good influence. And now I can no longer have that influence on them. And I think that, that's not something I like. I don't like the fact that I don't have, you know, it's, as a young adult, 19 living alone, it's, it's difficult when you don't have like people you can go to for help with stuff. You know what I mean? Like, like just logistical things in everyday life. Right. You want to have the thing of like, <laughs> like who, who do I call to ask if a specific dish can go in the microwave now that I've ostracized my family? And like, I had no motivation to do this. The only, I have only suffered personally lost for this. The reason I'm doing it is because I feel that it's number one, the right thing to do. And I will always do what I believe is the right thing, no matter the cost or consequences. And number two, I'm doing it because I think it's what's best for my siblings and the good people that are in my dad's church. Yeah. Wow. That's so important. That's a great point to make, John. And I can't imagine the last two weeks, how they've been on your heart. I know it's probably equally cathartic, but also um, painful <clears throat> beyond beyond words, painful. And um, I, I believe God, our God is a God of miracles. And I, I pray for the hearts of your parents that they soften. Um, maybe it is a lost cause, but um, maybe if they're presented with the idea, the fact that they might lose their children at some point for what they've done maybe that'll you know maybe that'll that'll yeah turn turn hopefully them. i don't know i i hope to god and i pray to god Stand and i'll straight. be praying for them yeah and i'll be praying for you too and and thank you so much thank for you. for talking with us john this was amazing um yeah i appreciate you guys hearing me out and talking to well, about this thank you very we'll, much we'll share your insta if that's okay we'll we'll yeah we'll put the insta yeah. in the show notes and we look forward to seeing how things progress in your life in more yeah. ways than one. Thank you. Thank you. Very I think that my faith out there is the, the best world. it's ever been right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since separating from that. my dad and his toxic misuse of Christianity 
and I had a lot of confusion. And I would say that there were even a lot of points in my life where I didn't even necessarily feel like I believed in any of it just because of how confused I was with him in my childhood. And then once I was able to rectify all that and have closure and peace on that and then understand that, wow, like this has nothing to do with God. And he is just another person who misused his platform, misused his position and abused and twisted scripture. Yeah, so insightful. That's so important. See, you you don't realize that you've you've become a leader in this small growing movement of people that might know they're in a church that's not quite right, or uh, maybe older children that feel like they, they don't have anybody, like all the years you grew up and you really didn't have anybody and you felt like there was no voice for you. Um, so inadvertently, you've, you've become kind of a leader <laughs> in this, which is a wonderful thing because I think you're a natural leader. Um, but, um, I, I don't know, I don't know about all that, but thank yeah, you. I know, so I know you're say. so young, you're so young to see yourself as that, but <laughs> what looking yeah. from the outside, looking in, uh, it's a hundred percent. Yeah. It's a hundred percent. What would you say to children in that situation? How did you about faith, about the distinction between what is going on in the name of God and who God truly is to you and how do you have a message like that to them? I would say develop your own personal faith, develop your own personal walk with God, read the Bible on your own, read what it says when it describes God, when it describes Jesus, read the messages of the Bible and start to deconstruct, yeah, your view of the of what you were taught growing up and then reconstruct based on the Bible and based on what is actually what the Bible actually says and find find good role models in your life, adults in your life that you can look at. And I know I had some great role models in my life in my early teenage years. And I think that like as teenager and a young adult, those some great men and women in my life that taught me a lot and influenced me a lot. And I think that are the reason why I did not become jaded or, or hateful or carry on this cycle of abuse because of those people and because of those voices and those people I saw in my life, I'm like, wow, like they're great parents, they're great spouses, they're great Christians, they're great members of their community. And find those role models in your life. Find those people you can look up to. I think naturally all of us look at our parents as role models, but you know, maybe when you get older, evaluate whether or not your parents should be role models or whether there are other people in your life that would make better role models develop your own personal faith, develop your own personal walk with God. And I'd say more than anything, don't let anything you have seen, don't let anything you have experienced change your view of the world or change your view of humanity. And I think that the world is a very imperfect place. And throughout my personal life and my childhood, I've experienced a lot of pain throughout my professional life. I have seen the worst that the world has to offer and I think that it's important to never let, never lose faith in humanity, understand that there are good people out there, there is good in the world, and as many bad people as there are, and as, as much as everything is imperfect, it all kind of fits together perfectly. How do we know who is the real deal, by the way? Just a little side note here. When it comes to preachers, how do we know who is the real deal? Right, because you got all these preachers out there, and they're they're preaching different things and and whatever. And the Bible warns us how there are all these false prophets out in the world, and there are there are good preachers, and then you got these false prophets. You know, how do you know? Okay, well, simple, two ways how you know who the real deal is. Number one, based on what the Bible says. Right, the Bible says in Isaiah eight twenty, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word. It is because there is no light in them. So if a preacher isn't lining up with the word of God, then he's a false prophet. It's that simple. If he's, if he's preaching and it does not jibe with what we have in the Bible, he's a false prophet. I think that's pretty easy to understand, pretty simple, pretty clear. I think you could use a lot of scriptures to prove that. I just gave you one. But number two, the Bible says you will know them by their fruits. Beware of false prophets, the Bible says in Matthew 7, 15, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, this is a legitimate example of don't judge by the appearance. Judge righteous judgment. They come to you outwardly in sheep's clothing. Is that not the appearance? 
the appearance of sheep, the appearance of godly Christianity, but inwardly, they're ravening wolves. How do I know, God? How do I know the true sheep from the wolf that is in sheep's clothing? You shall know them by their fruits.